we have three very powerful speakers from our Sir Optimist members. We're going to start with Talat Pasha, who's on the side of me, who's a very good friend, and she comes from Karachi in Pakistan. She's a consultant working in Karachi hospitals and spends a great deal of her time working in a small clinic in Kotri, helping the rural women of Sindh with their health issues. So I'm going to hand over to Talat, who I know will uh, give you some very challenging things to think about. She first faces violence when the ultrasonologist declares that the fetus in the womb is a female. Abortion is the first thought in her parents' minds. She is given away to settle family feuds or deaths of her father, sacrificed in the custom of one. Or married off at nine years of age as a child bride for monetary gains or to procure a wife or a brother or an uncle under the custom of Matta Sattta. <coughs> she faces hunger and starvation from childhood so that the male members of her family can have enough to eat. She may be sold off at a very young age as a domestic servant, then trafficked into sexual slavery. As she enters puberty, it is decided by culture, customs and her family that she does not have the right to sexual pleasure. The sexual act must never give her pleasure. So, her genitals are mutilated. She is sexually harassed at her workplace and streets. She is worried about her appearance and expression. Is it modest enough? Otherwise, she may be accused of inviting men and being provocative. So, she better be covered from head to toe. She is threatened and shot at because she dared to think about going to school. She must be killed, otherwise other girls may start thinking about education and empowerment. She dare not fall in love. No, that is not allowed at all. If she dares to, then she should be prepared to be killed in the name of honor. Dumped in an unmarked grave, her existence forgotten forever. She may decide to be a good girl and not fall in love and refuse the romantic overtures of a young man. Acid is then thrown on her face, mutilating her face and destroying her vision and life permanently. How dare she not respond? She may be married to a total stranger in an arranged and forced marriage, facing domestic violence for the rest of her life. If the demands of dowry by her in-laws are not met satisfactorily, she is burnt, another number in the thousands of cases of pride burn. She must never venture out to work in order to end the starvation of her children. Her husband, a drug addict, remains jobless. Because if she dares to train herself as a health worker, six bullets will be pumped into her abdomen and she will be left to die with her other colleagues on the streets of Karachi or Kabul. From being just a seed in her mother's womb to the day she is buried in her grave, she faces violence at every level, at every stage of her life. She, ladies, is today's woman in South Asia and in many other developing countries. Anissa was an orphan and lived in rural Afghanistan. She was in her early 20s and studying in 10th grade in order to continue studying, she worked as a health worker to eradicate polio. As Anissa
Lisa stepped out of, outside her home. Six bullets were pumped into her stomach. Naseema, 19, lived in Gandhi, Karachi to help pay for the schooling of her younger siblings. She worked as a health worker for two dollars a day. She was shot dead with six other female polio workers in Karachi. Damini and her fiancé wanted to go to the movies. She was lured into a bus by six people waiting. Her. her intestines were then washed out by inserting an iron rod into her genitals. All Malala wanted was education. She was shot in the head for standing up for female education. Luckily, she survived and is now recovering. These are just a few examples of women from my part of the world. Violence against women has become uncontrolled and though much work has been done for women empowerment, unfortunately the level of violence has increased. From battering and beatings, it has now gone up to murdering and torture. But there is good news. Women are joining hands. From Cairo to South Asia, from Iceland to Middle East, women are now fighting back in innovative ways to protect each other. We are speaking out on the streets, on media and television, we are getting organized and we are getting angry. Enough is enough. End street harassment. End domestic violence. End rape culture. There is a mood of mutiny. We are at the tipping point. Women from my part of the world are being supported by Western women. Please keep the pressure on. Continue doing the good work that we are doing. I urge my wonderful organization, Sir Optimist Inter International, that works in 127 countries, to continue working towards making a positive difference in the lives of women all over the world. What is fascinating about this new mood is its independence and courage. In Cairo, women brandishing knives came out to protest against street violence. The government of India was frightened into taking a stand on rape culture. The government of Pakistan had to speak out against the Taliban and fly Malala and her family out to safety. One is humbled by this courage, courage of all women who risk rejection and violence but strive for a better tomorrow for their daughters. And the good news, ladies, is that courage is always contagious. Now to discuss how can women attain a violence-free life? Education. Not only the kind of education that is being imparted in our schools now, but a new concept will have to be introduced. Human rights education must be added to our school curriculum. Physics, chemistry and literature are not enough. If they were, Professors would not be molesting young students. Domestic violence would not occur in countries with a high literacy rate. Time has now come when we must start thinking about working on a new educational system. Human rights must be introduced as a compulsory subject and taught to every child in every school in the world, including religious schools. Let us pray for the day when humans can learn to live in peace and harmony with each other. Thank you. I think the challenge is there, isn't it? We have to have courage when we listen to how some of our sisters are treated in many parts of the world. And if we don't have the courage to stand up for um, saying this is wrong, then we are not the people that we want to be. So I, I
challenge you all as well to have the courage to support the sort of things we, you know, to say these are wrong, we must do that. So now I'm going to hand over to another sort of optimist, and this time it's uh, Violetta Bonescu from Moldova. She graduated from the University of Moldova Department of International Relations and Economics. She started her career in the Ministry of Finance, working in the European Integration Directorate for three years. She then moved to work with the United Nations on a program to do with HIV and AIDS. She works today with UN Women in a program of women's economic empowerment. So, Violetta, I'm going to hand over to you, and I think Violetta wants to go and stand. Good morning, ladies. It's my pleasure to be here with you, and I would like to share uh, some of my experience from my country. In Moldova, like in many other parts of the world, women are facing different forms of violence, and I would quote some women who have been facing violence. So, a woman aged 30 years old, she's mentioning, my husband wants me to stay all the time at home. He wants me to warm up his food, prepare his clothes, arrange his table, and I want to be independent. Woman aged 40 years old, I had a difficult life. My husband was beating me all the time. He was very violent. Once he hit me with a chopper in my head, I had been hospitalized. Woman aged 50 years old, I was 16 years old when I had been raped by my future husband. I had to do many bad things against my will. I have suffered a lot. I had to marry him because I was pregnant. He has been very violent and it has affected me and my entire life. I regret it a lot. And the last cases we had in January on a, a four-year-old uh, girl has been beaten to death by her father. So as you can see, uh, women, girls and women in Moldova face violence throughout their lifespan. In Moldova, women represent 51% of 3 million inhabitants. 6 out of 10 women in urban areas and 7 out of 10 women in rural areas have faced one of the forms of domestic violence, being economic, psychological, physical or sexual. 60% of the women from the entire population said that once in their life they face a form of uh, domestic violence from their husbands, par uh, partners, parents or parents-in-law uh, or stepfathers. Domestic violence is very spread throughout Moldova and is accepted as a social cultural norm. According to the data provided by a center which is hosting a hotline for women, including victims of domestic violence, 91% of all calls on behalf of women are those women who accuse men of domestic violence. We have persons which would accuse of domestic violence as well others' families women, but these are very seldom, and it usually came from mothers and mothers-in-law. That confirms once again that uh, spouses, partners, and parents want to maintain the traditional family which has this disciplinary role in regards to women. Almost half of the women, they said they didn't report the violence because they thought that they could deal with it by themselves or that they were ashamed of what relatives and friends and neighbors would say. Social stigmatization is very high, and a woman is considered by herself to be the cause of domestic violence inside the family. Nevertheless, uh, despite all these sad facts provided by different studies, there, are, there is some progress, and the government of Moldova is putting a lot of effort into that. They have adopted legislative frameworks, laws, and amendments to laws to ensure and to combat domestic violence and violence against the women. They also have implemented protection orders, which started to function. Nevertheless, the major problem is inappropriate enforcement of law. In Moldova, social assistants are responsible for issues of uh, family and domestic violence, 
and the social assistant can be found in every town hall or city hall. But because the social assistant is so overcrowded with our responsibilities, sometimes he, he or she doesn't have enough time to pay attention to all these problems, especially those uh, faced by women. Um, here comes the role of NGOs, which are trying to cover some legs which the state cannot cover all the aspects. In Moldova we have 13 centers which are spread out through the territory of Moldova and they are providing support services including to victims of domestic violence. They are um, financially supported as well by the state through a co-shared uh, approach. We are always talking that domestic <coughs> violence has happened, women have suffered <coughs> violence, uh, women have been beaten and they have been sexually harassed. But what is the knowledge about domestic violence? What women know? A study revealed that women know that domestic violence and violence against women is a crime, but they don't know where to go and what to do and whom to approach. Another interesting fact is that the, um, an organization, uh, a non-governmental organization, has carried another survey to find out which are the factors and the causes rooting for this domestic violence. And 79% of the respondents said that is the excessive use of alcohol, 80% said that this is the, um, the factor is the authoritarian model of family, and 8% said that it's women's fault because they want to be emancipated and they want to be empowered. Government, my government, together with uh, NGOs and international programs, um, carries out different activities targeting uh, prevention of violence against women. And last year, in the context of 16 days campaigns of activism against gender-based violence, uh, the motto of the campaign was, true men don't hit women. Because as I said before, the majority of perpetrators are men, represented by husbands, partners, uh, parents, or parents-in-law, or stepfathers. And throughout their lifespan, girls aged like from the birth till 16 years old are usually uh, facing violence from their uh, fathers. Um, ladies aged from 16 years old to 25 and higher, they are facing violence from their boyfriends, from their partners, from their spouses, and so on. So optimist doesn't stay away in Moldova from these issues and is getting uh, involved in tackling this to help women to advance their lives and promote themselves. In the cooperation of the Optimist Union of Norway, International Organization for Migration and Local Center for Children's Rights, so Optimist in Moldova has implemented two projects. First of the one targeted the social orphans, the girls which are in the boarding school without parent supervision. Because when you are in a family, you kind of have a support. When you are without a family, you are lost. The, um, mm, this, uh, this initiative targeted life skills training and program for 100, uh, 120 girls from four boarding schools. Um, uh, continuing uh, assisting with vocational education, uh, psychological help and support, uh, trainings on healthy relationships and balanced relationships, and what are the roles of women and men in society. Another uh, objective was, uh, another initiative was called uh, Profession Based Skills, and it targeted children and parents from three villages. And aside from learning a profession, they had trainings. But the trainings were organized jointly with children and parents. And parents highly commended these trainings because they said, it was for the first time when I could talk with my children about such issues as a healthy relationship, as a relationship in the family between women and men, between mother and father, between children. And I could tackle different other issues. So, um, there is still a lot of work to do, but as I said before, women are afraid to talk and domestic violence and violence against women is considered more of a private issue.
So I urge you, let's make it a public issue. Let's talk about this loud, outside this room, in the street, in your cities, in your countries. And let's not forget that only through communication, awareness raising, training, we can reach that society uh, which is um, free of violence. And I'm very sorry that today in our auditorium we don't have any boys or any men because um, they are sort of our first target audience. And the gender empowerment is about both girls and boys, women and men. So let's work together with them to avoid domestic violence and to avoid violence against women and to eliminate this fire from our life. Thank you very much. So we come to our final speaker, um, last but certainly not least. She's Kate Brady Keane from New Zealand, a member of Sorocton's International of Auckland. Her background is sociology and feminism. And she has an MA in counselling and advanced psychotherapy. She's worked with both women and children focusing on trauma and abuse. She's run a homeless project, a rape crisis service, and she's currently a senior lecturer on counselling and women's issues, a practicing psychotherapist specialising in trauma. Kate. to speak this morning. Um, as we mentioned, my name is Kate Brady Keane. I'm a Sroptimist from Auckland, New Zealand, and I've worked for 15 years with women and children in the fields of domestic and sexual violence in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the USA, and back in the UK. First of all, I want to thank my colleagues and my fellow panellists for sharing your stories here today. It's amazing to see the work that's being done around the world at this time, and it's amazing to hear what's being done for women and children in our society. However, still, when I hear these stories, I can feel overwhelmed. I feel um, that at times, the amount of information that comes to us can leave us feeling as though, what can we do? It can leave us feeling helpless and hopeless. And really, what we need is some skills to take forward. When I was asked to speak on this subject, I began to look at the projects I've been involved in over the years. I began thinking about the statistics that we all know so well. One in four women will experience violence in their lifetime. One in three women will experience sexual violence. One in four girls will experience sexual violence or rape before she's 16. These are statistics that we know too well and that we hear constantly. But then I stop to think about prevention and actually what prevention means in relationship to the work that we do and the outcomes that we can have for these women and children across the world. As I mentioned, at times it can feel so overwhelming to work in the field and I imagine to hear the information that you've had over the last few days here at this conference. And sometimes I find that placing that work in a larger context, one, allows me to stay sane and to continue doing the work I'm doing, and gives me something so solid to hold on to and a solid ground to stand on as I move forward and help more women and as I move forward and hear more stories. Prevention and primary prevention have become buzzwords in our sector over the last decade. With funders, governments, and policy, reports, frameworks often wanting prevention and in particular primary prevention to be a focus of any programme that's being run. We often focus on this area, but what I'd like to do today is just take a moment to stop and actually think what primary prevention means, what that looks like, and how we can use these tasks in our everyday life to empower the women and children around us and to give ourselves a solid ground to stand on as we hear these stories and as we move forward in our own work. So according to the White Ribbon Foundation, primary prevention strategies are implemented before the violence occurs. These strategies aim to lessen the likelihood of boys and of men using violence and in the, fir in the first place, and women suffering in the first place. What I notice is they did miss girls out of this um, 
this area and what I'd like to say is primary prevention is to help stop girls and women suffering in the first place. There are three acknowledged types of prevention strategies. We have primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary, as mentioned, occurs before the violent event occurs. It may take the form of education programs in schools, in communities, in colleges, in churches, it may appear in the form of early childhood education, information on drugs and alcohol and substance misuse. In New Zealand we have some great programmes that look at this primary prevention. One is called Sex and Respect, which is run through um, great prevention education and is, done, is a programme that's done through high schools. So it's engaging and allowing young people to think about healthy sexual relationships, what that means, how we may engage in this. So whilst it's an education programme, its focus is to get people to think differently is to give people different information in ways to think. We also have another program, a preschool program called We Can Keep Safe, which is an awesome program that's run by um, two actresses actually, two um, moderately famous um, female um, actresses in New Zealand. And they go into preschools, into kindergartens, and they run a program for seven days, an hour a morning, helping young people understand what good touch and bad touch is, to actually name their body parts, so if something does happen to these young people, they're actually fully equipped with the information to tell people what has happened. And it's also a very empowering process for parents, as I think as one of my colleagues mentioned. For some it's the first time they actually get to have these conversations with their young people. Some people say starting at this age, it is too young, but I think equipping women and young girls with information about who they are and their rights is never something that can start too young, as long as it's done in an appropriate age appropriate way. So primary prevention is information given before the event to stop the abuse happening. Secondary prevention, which is also known as early intervention, occurs when an at-risk group is identified. So either a potential or a group that may have an increased potential to offend, or a group that may be at increased risk, increased vulnerability. The aim is to look at behaviours and attitudes and to target them before they're fully established, before they're um, acted upon, and to increase awareness of those who are at risk in either camp. These, implement, these um, focuses could be, could be implemented in schools where maybe there's been a rash of sexual assault or rape. They could be implemented in neighbourhoods or communities where there is an increased risk of domestic violence or gendered violence. But secondary again is before the violence takes place but with targeted groups. So tertiary prevention looks at the responses that occur after the violence has taken place. It deals with the immediate and long-term impacts for survivors, and it looks to contain, help, and manage um, both the immediate ex experience and to, to prevent the offender reoffending. The primary, secondary, tertiary, all focusing on and addressing change in behaviour and thought, but at different cycles of the offending cycle. What we want to be really clear is not to confuse primary prevention and prevention programs and education programs. The focus of a prevention program is to promote behaviour change and to increase knowledge of gendered violence. Now this is often done through education programs and certainly raising awareness and education is a very good byproduct of a prevention program. But the prevention program is not to increase knowledge particularly, it's to help people challenge ways of thinking and to help change behaviour. According to the Victoria Health Board, the goal of prevention programmes are to reduce the overall incidence of gendered violence. It looks at the factors and the conditions such as gender inequality, patriarchy, gender socialisation, social norms that facilitate, excuse and create gendered violence supportive cultures. Prevention programmes, the, the focus of prevention programmes is to challenge thinking and attitudes around violence which will produce, or hope to produce, different behaviours in individuals. Because we know the act of committing violence is always a choice. People choose to commit violent acts, and what we need to do is equip people with different ways of thinking and being in the world to challenge this. So there are many factors that influence individuals' way of thinking. Seeing the world and behaving. And it's these ways of thinking that need to be gently challenged, and there are many ways to do that. But what I'd like to do is just give one example here today that you may hopefully take away with you and may give you something to work with and maybe, maybe solidify the, step, the ground that you sometimes stand on when faced with issues such as gender violence. 
So one way to look at this is through a language. Now, there is only so much language in the world, and we do not create our own language. Language is given to us based on space, place, and time. Where we're from, the time that we live in, and the culture and community that sits around us. I was told this was a chair. As a child, I was given language that helped me understand what this was. I didn't create this word, I didn't create the concept, it was learned based on space, place, and time. I know that there's different chairs in the world, I kind of know those are chairs as well. I know there's different chairs in my living room, I know my office may have a bit of a different chair. In my culture, I know what to do with the chair. I know how to sit on it, like a lady, as we may have been taught. Um, I also know that if somebody comes into a room who's maybe older than me, or pregnant, or has children, that it's my cultural role to move and give somebody else that chair. I know all these things about chairs, but I don't consciously think of that when I interact with the chair. I see a chair, and I use it to sit on it and do what I need. So even though I have this wealth of information sitting behind me, in the moment I interact with the chair and the cultural appropriateness of, cultural appropriateness of this without really thinking. I'm a woman. I grew up with an understanding of what a woman was, what being a woman was. For each of you, if you just take a moment to think, you will also grow up with an understanding of what a woman was. You were given language to understand it, you were given context and space, place and time to understand what a woman was. When people interact with me, there are a million different things that inform how they would interact with me as a woman. They are not consciously thinking of them every moment, but they're there, because it's, it's, it's hereditary, it's given to us, it's an understanding. Um, but it's not necessarily always conscious. But it's based within their own space, place, time and understanding, the language that they've been given to understand in the context of a woman. I was just recently at home, I, I live in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, my family live back in the UK. I just went home and um, three, four different aunts at least came up to me and the first thing they said to me is, where are your children? Like I, like I left them at home or I forgot to pack them. <laughs> because for them, they can't understand the context of a 35 year old woman not having children. And they're lovely women, they love me very much, they, they care for me. But for them, the, the idea, the context of me not having children is, is just too hard. So before, how are you doing? How's your job? Congratulations for getting to go to a conference in the UN. Where are your children? <laughs> it's the context of where they grew up and how they understood the world. So how does this apply to prevention programs? So the goal is to offer a wider context, a different understanding, other language to understand people, places and time. If you've grown up with a specific idea of what a woman is, a specific idea of what masculinity and what femininity is, then sometimes preventing the goal of a prevention program is to gently challenge that idea, to give people different context to think about masculinity and femininity give people different contexts and ideas to think about violence, to think about gender, to think about responsibility. There are many ways in which we can approach this, but simply, on a basic level, sometimes by just widening people's understanding of the world, we can help shift the way people think by giving them more language, which can result in a change in behaviour. So it is, but this is also quite culturally specific as well. So what I've heard time and time again from this conference is not with us, sorry, not for us, with us. So as you're working with different cultural contexts, as you're working with different people, it's so important to engage them and involve them in the prevention programs that you do. If we go back to my chair, in my culture it's fine for me to sit on one chair and maybe have my feet on another chair. It's not a huge no-no, but in some cultures that would be very inappropriate. It would be inappropriate to put feet on a chair, it would be inappropriate to show the soles of my feet. I wouldn't necessarily know that from my worldview. So the importance of inviting people from different worldviews to be involved in the creation of these programs, I think, is essential. So back to the chair. Always about the chair. <laughs> so what I hope to do today is to just give you some information to take forward. As I said, working in the field, I at times can feel extremely overwhelmed by the information that comes at me. 
and certainly being in this forum has been an amazing experience, but at times it can feel like there's so much going on in the world and what can I do about it? What changes can I make? And we can at times be left feeling quite helpless and hopeless. So hopefully by understanding language as a context and maybe helping understand and explain to those around you about different ways of seeing the world, we can help shift and change the attitudes of those around us and help keep ourselves grounded in the work that we do and the information that we hear. Kia ora. Three questions at a time, and then I will repeat the question because um, 